Well, just before our break, we were concluding our discussion of uh, the Quran and the Bible. We never conclude the discussion. It goes on, but uh, we need to move on to other themes. I would like to just say, as, um, as we're leaving that, that, that topic, that uh, it is very important to function respectfully in regards to Scripture, whether it be Muslim Scripture or whether it be um, our, our Christian Scriptures. I, um, I travel with this little Quran, and you can see it has been used a lot, but it's an English interpretation. I hesitate to travel with my Arabic Quran because I put it in my briefcase and so forth. And if, as if Muslims, would, if Muslims would see that, they would feel it's quite disrespectful. That the Quran, according to them, must be handled very reverently. You need to do ablutions, first of all. And of course, you don't mark it and so forth. So I would never think of putting marks on the Arabic Quran. Um, so um, treat it respectfully. The uh, Muslims believe it should be the highest item in the, in the room. I don't mean you as a Christian need to practice that, but remember that Muslims um, expect the Quran to be treated reverently and respectfully. And in turn, we need to treat the Bible respectfully. Uh, look here, I had another book on top of it. If a Muslim were in this group, he would feel quite offended about that. You should not have another book on top of the Bible. It supersedes other books, you see. And uh, of course, you would never ever think of putting the Bible on the floor. Um, if you go to the mosque, they, have, they sit on the floor, but the Quran is always put on a stand. And to put the Bible on the floor would seem to be very, very disrespectful. When you walk down the street with your Bible, handle it respectfully. Don't just walk along like this, you know, as if it's a bag of potatoes. You uh, walk with it. Uh, with the respect to do the holy word of God. Uh, Muslims often feel that we treat our Bibles pretty carelessly as they observe how we treat them. Um, so remember, Muslims have a very high view of scripture and we do very well in the way we handle the Bible or the way we handle the Quran to handle it with the respect which communicates to Muslims that we um, have a high respect, especially to the Bible, which is the word of God upon which we stand. Yeah. So just those concluding comments as we move on now to our next topic, which is um, uh, Tanzil and incarnation. These different views of revelation. Within Islam, they believe that the eternal word, and I've done another diagram here, the Um ul Kitab, the eternal word, the mother of the book, that, that the core of it, this, the soul of the mother of the book, has come down, tanzil, in the Arabic language, in the form of the Quran. It's a sent down revelation. So you can say, the word has become book within Islam. The eternal word has become book, the Quran. Now within the gospel, within the Christian movement, why the eternal word has become human. It has become incarnated in Jesus the Messiah. And so we'll be, we'll, we'll be exploring now those, those, those realities. As Muslims and Christians meet one another, the Muslims come into the conversation with this word, the Quran, which they believe is eternal, has become book. Christians enter into the conversation committed to the living word, which has become human. How do we then interpret the living word? I want to spend some time on that. Uh, who is Jesus, the Messiah? And uh, I would say that there is a very serious misunderstanding has entered into the conversation, which we need to address immediately. And that is, what do we mean by Jesus as Son of God? The serious misunderstanding, I don't know where it came from. Uh, but I have a hunch. I'll just imagine for a moment, and I don't think it's an uneducated imagination when I'm saying what I'm going to say now. Muhammad, in the early years of his preaching in Mecca, uh, it's very obvious that he was in contact with Christians. And of course, when he went to Medina, particularly with Jews as well. And uh, he was seeking um, to find what Christians really believe. 
And I can imagine him having multiple conversations over tea and so forth with the few Christians who lived in Mecca. There was a monk, a Christian monk who became his friend. And I can just imagine over a teacup there in Mecca sometime early on, Muhammad saying, now, when you say Trinity uh, as Christians, what, what do you mean by that? What, what do you mean by Trinity? And remember, there's no Bibles in the Arabic language. So even this Christian monk, uh, his access to the written scriptures was not there. All that they knew was an oral tradition floating around. And sometimes they got it right, sometimes they got it wrong. And I can just imagine this monk scratching his head and saying, well, my friend Muhammad, that is a very good question. By Trinity, what we mean is that there's the Father God called Yahweh, and Father God Yahweh had a wife called Mary the Virgin, and Mary the Virgin and, and, and Father God Yahweh had a son called Jesus. And so Trinity is Father, Mother, and Son. Yahweh, the Virgin Mary, and the Son Jesus. That's what is meant by Trinity. And Muhammad just was infuriated. He is preaching against polytheism there in Mecca. We mentioned the other day that outside of Mecca is a trilogy of gods who are called the daughters of God, of Allah. This was polytheism. And they are called Alat, al Uzza, Al-Manat. And Muhammad is preaching strenuously against that kind of polytheism, which sees Allah as the father of daughter goddesses. And a connection with the worship of these goddesses, there was all kinds of awful things went on that Muhammad is preaching against. And the bells that ring in his mind are that Christians have the same kind of theology. That Yahweh is a father god and he's married to a mother goddess called Mary and this goddess and God have a child called Jesus and that's what Trinity is all about. And so in the, tr in, in, in the Quranic confrontation against the Trinity, that's what they're fighting against, you see, which we also fight against. We don't believe that kind of rubbish, you see. And that must be clarified if any Muslim is going to give any consideration to the gospel. So the Quranic critique of uh, Trinitarian theology, it's hard to know as you read the Quran, whether this critique is directed against Christians or against polytheists. You see, it's a critique. Um, is Muhammad attacking and confronting polytheism or is he contacting the Christians? In the Quran, it doesn't say this is what Christians believe. It just simply says, Trinity, terrible idea that God had a wife and had a son, you see, which it is a terrible idea, but it doesn't accuse the Christians of believing that. It's confronting polytheism, but of course, a very strong hint that if this is what Christians do believe, they better jolly well stop believing that kind of rubbish, and we agree with that. We agree with that. You know, at this time, uh, within the churches, there was uh, a lot of phraseology such as Mary is the mother of God. In fact, this was one of the Nestorian problems. Bishop Nestorius, we talked about Nestorians the other day, and the question about the crucifixion of Jesus and so forth. Bishop Nestorius also said, I think that kind of language almost sounds polytheistic. Mary, the mother of God. Wouldn't it be better to say Mary is the mother of Christ? <laughs> You know, let's not start moving in directions that sound as if Mary is maybe somehow a kind of goddess giving birth to God. So Nestorius was suggesting, let's, let's use other kind of language, Mary the mother of Christ. So this was being debated among the churches, how you refer to Mary, as mother of God or mother of Christ. And there were some Christians who referred to her as the mother of God. And uh, you go down that direction and pretty soon it can begin to sound as if you are a polytheist. So that's the context in which, in which, um, in which uh, this, the notion of Son of God or Trinity uh, is, is confronted within, within the Quran, a confrontation that we, that we also embrace. And it's on Muslims' minds all the time. I know before we went to Somalia, a well-meaning missionary told us, now this thing of Jesus as Son of God, don't talk about that for two years. 
become good friends of the Muslims first. And then after two years, you're drinking tea around a tea table, and you say to your Muslim friend, now, there's something I want to share with you. I know it's going to shock you, but uh, please just hear me out, please. I believe Jesus is the Son of God. And he jumps up and the tea flies off the table. He's so absolutely astounded at such an awful idea. But hopefully, you can weather the storm. You can find your way through the storm because uh, you have become friends. So you don't talk about this for at least two years. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. Because the question of who Jesus is, is foremost in the minds of Muslims, I find, wherever I go. Do you believe Jesus is the Son of God? The question is always there. And implicit in the question is, are you a polytheist? Do you believe that Mary is somehow part of the Trinity? That's within the question. I remember one time in Somalia, we were riding a bus 55 kilometers from Mogadishu, the capital city, to Johar, where we were developing our school. And um, there with my family, sitting at the back of the bus, and guy at the front, and there's a noisy bus with the jukebox going, yeah, 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 you know. The guy towards the front shouts back, and who are you back there? I said, I'm Dao Shek. Oh, so you're a Muslim, are you? I said, actually not, I'm a Christian. Oh, so you believe that God had a son and had a wife, you see? You can't wait till you're sitting around a teacup. It's right there all the time. So I had to respond right there, you know, in the public arena to what I mean by Jesus as Son of God. You can't wait. You're having a gentle cup of tea with a friend that you've known for two years. It's always there, always there. So how do we address the question? Well, first I want to say uh, there are several uh, misunderstandings that we need to make clear. And the first is that we do not believe in that kind of Trinitarian theology that there's God, and he has a wife, and they have a son. That's rubbish. Let's put that out the door. Let's lay that aside. And that must be done very, very forthrightly. No Muslim will ever consider the gospel if he believes that what we mean is that God had a spouse and had a son. I won't become a Christian either if that's what Christians believe. That's polytheism, you see? So let's put that out the door. Now, there's a couple other, also, misperceptions in the Quran. Christians do not believe, I'm looking at point one here in the outline for following along. Christians do not believe that Jesus is one of three gods. Okay, so the Quran says, don't believe that God had a spouse. We agree. Do not believe that Jesus is one of three gods. We don't believe that either. Trinitarian theology is not tritheism. It's not tritheism. So let's put that out the door as well. We don't believe in that. We don't believe that Jesus, that Christ is one of two gods. You see, we don't believe that. So let's put that out the door as well. We do not believe that God is Christ. We don't believe that. We believe Christ is God. Now I'm mentioning this because each of these are specifically stated in the Quran. Don't believe God had a spouse? Amen, we agree. Do not believe Christ is one of two gods? Amen. We agree. Do not believe Christ is one of three gods. Amen. We agree. Don't believe that God is Christ. Amen. We agree. We believe that Christ is God, but not that God is Christ. You see, if God is Christ, then when he is crucified, the God of the whole universe dies. There's no God around anymore. You see, the biblical language is God was in Christ. God was fully in Christ. The fullness of God dwelt in Christ, you see. So that when we meet Christ, we're meeting God in Christ. But it's not to say that God is Christ. It's to say Christ is God. Are you tracking with me? It's very important, you see. How many times, I was just in Khartoum here recently, and um, in Sudan. And we had an evening of dialogue, which was also put on video, by the way. It's passed around CDs and they're in the city, capital city of, of Sudan. And this was a question. They pressed me on pretty hard. You believe in the cross? Absolutely. You believe that, that, that in the incarnation, that Christ is God? Absolutely. No, they didn't say it that way. They said, do you believe God is Christ? I said, no, I don't believe that. I believe Christ is God. Well, they said, what happened at the crucifixion? You mean that if, if God is Christ, 
Then when the crucifixion happened, then God died. There's no God around. No, 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 no. I said Christ is God. And God raised him from the dead when he was crucified. But there's always relational language. Christ has a relationship with God, a perfect relationship, a relationship of unity. And so God is in Christ redeeming the world. And God in Christ raises him from the dead, you see, you see. So we talked about that quite a bit. This comes up a lot about the cross. So we have to keep it clear, our language. God is in Christ. That's biblical language. Okay? So I'm just saying those are clarification points. I think it's important that we make early on when we're talking with Muslim theologians. Now granted, most Muslims don't even know the Quran says this, you see. So it's not a, it's a, it's a new point. Um, but uh, for those who are theologians, this comes up all the time. Let me just pause for a response or question about what I'm saying. Would it be right to say that Christ is fully God and fully man, 100% yes, God? Yes, 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 absolutely, absolutely. That's why we cannot say God is Christ. Yes. Because in Christ there are two. That's right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Incarnation means God is in Christ. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's, that's very helpful. Yeah. You know, Islam is very good for us Christians. Because Islam forces us to be good theologians. <laughs> uh, but most of us never thought of what it means when we say God is Christ. But that's not good theology. <laughs> it's not biblical theology. We never thought of that, you see. But the Islamic question, you say God is Christ? What happened at the crucifixion? That's what they say. It forces us to be good theologians. You can't be a careless theologian and engage Islam. Yeah. And this is one of the questions that, that is there that we need to look at. Yes. Do you think would it be better if uh, uh, ancient Christians would uh, come to the conclusion that, uh, mother, that Mary is mother of Christ, not mother of God? Well, that's what Nestorius said. Yeah. He said that is better language. Personally, I feel the same way. Yeah. Yeah. Because when you say Christ is the mother of God, it moves you in directions that feel polytheistic to me. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. But this is Catholic theology. You know, and, and there in Jerusalem, there in Jerusalem, you have um, uh, right beside the uh, Mosque of Omer, there in, in, in Jerusalem, which is just a very important spiritual center for, for Muslims, here you have this large church just alongside which is dedicated to Mary, the mother of God. <laughs> and must say, oh, yo, 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 these Christians. <laughs> dear, dear, dear. <laughs> must say, oh, these Orthodox and Catholic. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. They always tell me, your Protestants are bad, but they're, at least, they're a little better. <laughs> mm. So who then is Jesus the Messiah? How do we interpret to who he is? Well, let me tell you a story. Um, again, back to that central London mosque experience. A lot happened that night. And the other nights of those dialogues when I was in the UK. But um, first of all, we had two hours of uh, discussion back and forth, the Muslim theologian and I. And then for one hour, there was questions from the floor. And the first question on the table was, do you believe Jesus is the Son of God? So I couldn't wait for two years drinking tea before I talk about it. Right there it is with, 200, with 400 probably Muslims packing out the, uh, the auditorium that evening, the basement of that mosque. And I love that question. I just love it when that question comes my way because it opens the door by God's grace to seek to interpret who Jesus is. And so I said, thank you so very, very much for the question. And this is what I shared with them, which I share many times with Muslim people. But just imagine, I'm sharing this in the context of hundreds of Muslims who are listening and really wanting to know what we mean by Jesus as Son of God. Well, the first thing I said, let's clear some rubbish out of the way. We do not believe that God had a spouse and had a son. Ten billion times no. Let's put that out the door. It's rubbish. It even makes me feel like vomiting, even to say such a thing. So let's put that away. This is not Christian theology at all. Also, we don't believe that Christ is one of three gods or one of two gods. Let's put that out of the way. We don't believe God is Christ. You know, let's put all of that out of the way. 
But now let's look at what we really mean. And the name Son of God is a name that humankind did not give to Jesus the Messiah. It is God himself named the Messiah, my beloved son. In fact, when the angel Gabriel came to the Virgin Mary, and by the way, in the Quran, Gabriel does appear to the Virgin Mary, you know, so they're tracking. When the angel Gabriel came to the Virgin Mary, he announced to the Virgin that his name will be called, will be the Son of God. Why? What does Gabriel mean by that name? And then two times in the ministry of Jesus, God spoke from heaven, this is my beloved son. At his baptism, when he began his ministry, and I didn't mention this to the Muslims because they wouldn't be aware of it, but I will say to you here, and on the Mount of Transfiguration, when Moses and Elijah appear and talk with Jesus, God spoke in the cloud on the Mount of Transfiguration, this is my beloved son, hear ye him. At that very moment, Moses and Elijah were gone. Only Jesus was on the mountain. This was God making clear that Jesus has the final authority. This is my beloved son, he said. So this name is a name given to Jesus by God. So we better take note. What does God mean when he says that Jesus is my beloved son? What does that name mean? Now I said, as I look at Islamic theology, there is some help in understanding the meaning of Jesus as Son of God. Because, I said, in the Quran I read that Jesus the Messiah is Kalimatullah. Which means the Word of God. Kalim, Word, At, of God. He is the Word of God. I read that in the Quran. Also, as I study Islamic philosophy, particularly the Asherite stream of Islamic philosophy, which is the predominant stream of modern day Islamic philosophy, as I read Asherite philosophy, I read that the Word of God is eternal with God, uncreated. And that there can be no deviance between God and His Word. Wow. That's Islamic philosophy. Have you benefited from this teaching ministry? Have you found TVS videos helpful and relevant? Please consider supporting TVS with your prayers and financial gifts. For more information, please visit www.tvseminary.com. Now remember I said the other day, it's never wise to make Islam preach the gospel. <laughs> You know, we're called to bear witness to the gospel. Let's not make the Quran and Islamic philosophy preach the gospel. But there's some signs here. There's some signs here. So this is what I said in the mosque that night. I said, now I'm fully aware that when the Asherites say that the word of God is eternal, uncreated, and that you can never divide God from the word, that what they're speaking about is the Um Ul Kitab, the eternal word in the heavens, from which the Taurat has come, and the Zabur has come, and the Injil has come, and from which preeminently the Quran has come, for the Quran is the very soul of the Um Ul Kitab. And what you're referring to is this mother of the book in the heavens. Many Muslims say it is inscribed on golden tablets in the heavens. I said, that's what you mean, not, yes, oh, yes, 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 yes. Schenck understands Islamic theology. Yeah, you know, that, that, that's right. They're on the other edge, yes, 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 yes. I said, <laughs> but surely that must be a metaphor. Because God's word is always living and dynamic. And you cannot capture God's word on golden tablets. 
For God is always speaking. It's through His Word that He not only creates, but He sustains the whole universe, you see. So I take it that when we say the Word is eternal, one essence with God, we're not talking, at least as a Christian, I'm not talking about it being on golden tablets. I see that as metaphorical language, not language that refers to some mother of the book in the heavens. Although I, I respect your Islamic understanding, but I'm just sharing as a Christian, I view it somewhat differently. Furthermore, I said, when I read that the word, uh, that Jesus is kalimatullah, I think that what you mean and what the Quran means is that God spoke and Jesus is miraculously created in the womb of the virgin, just as God spoke and Adam is miraculously created. Is that what you mean? Yes, 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 yes. yes. Oshanka understands Islamic theology. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's what we mean. Okay, I said, thank you. So this evening I've heard your Islamic witness. The word is eternal, uncreated, and it's, you, can't ever separate God, you can't ever separate God from his word, and you mean that God spoke, and the Messiah is miraculously created, miraculously created in the womb of the virgin. But I said, tonight you've invited me to share what the, what the gospel means about this. And so I turned to John chapter 1, verse 1. John chapter 1, verse 1. And here we read. Here we read, brothers and sisters. An amazing statement. In the beginning, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing has been made that has been made. In Him was life. And that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. That this eternal word of God is God's self-expression. Back at the very beginning, when creation first happened, God spoke. It's through his word that creation came into being. And it is through his word that creation is sustained. And it is absolutely true that this living word, which you can't capture in tablets of gold and so forth, this eternal word is eternal with God. It is one essence with God. It is never different from God because it proceeds from God, this eternal word. Now, the big surprise. Verse 14 of John chapter 1. This word, this eternal word, became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And we've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father full of grace and truth. And I said in the mosque, this means that the Messiah is truly, truly Kalimatullah. Not in the sense that God speaks and he is created in the womb of the virgin. No, he is truly, truly the incarnation the enfleshment of the eternal word of God. In, his, in him, the word has become human, and we behold this word as full of grace and truth. You see? And that's what we mean by Jesus as Son of God. You can never, ever divide God from his word. For God's word is his self-expression. It's through his word that he creates and sustains the universe and reveals his will. His word has become human and lives among us. And because you can never put a wedge between God and his word, when we meet Jesus, we're meeting God with us. For God and his word are one essence. That's what Jesus as son of God means. The word of God among us. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry 
you may give online at efca.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota. 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com